I'm Christian Bryant. We're diving deep into a few stories that might not be on your radar. Here's what we're looking at. The Federal Emergency Management Agency changed up their flood insurance rates, and it could impact as many as one in 10 homeowners. We take a look at the updates. Then the definition of vaccine hesitancy is pretty specific, but it might not be a fair term to attach to all of the people who have yet to get a COVID-19 shot. We look into other factors that could hold someone back. But first, let's put the spotlight back on a story that seems to have fallen out of the news cycle. When US troops first withdrew from Afghanistan, it made headlines everywhere. You couldn't open up a news site or listen to a news podcast without getting stories about the withdrawal and the seemingly messy conclusion of America's longest war. We brought you stories about how the Taliban takeover impacted Afghans, including details about the uncertainty women and girls now face and the dangers Afghan journalists dealt with as they fought for free press. It's been more than a month since the last of the US troops left, and while the news cycle has shifted toward other topics, the problems have only been ramping up for people still living in Afghanistan. The country has seen a string of violent attacks with recent bombings of mosques, killing dozens of people each time. ISIS-K or the Islamic State, who are enemies of the Taliban, have claimed responsibility for some of those attacks. The Taliban has also returned to brutal punishments like public hangings, and they haven't stuck to their promises of giving women fair treatment. There's also an economic and humanitarian crisis on the rise. The central bank is frozen, there has been a huge rise in the price of goods, and many people aren't getting paid. The European Union recently pledged over $1 billion in aid to Afghanistan. In a tweet, the president of the EU Commission emphasized the importance of this aid, saying, We must do all we can to avert a major humanitarian and socioeconomic collapse in Afghanistan. We need to do it fast. The US is also offering assistance, but has made it clear they will not officially recognize the Taliban. They will, however, offer aid and continue their focus on refugee resettlement efforts. We have been in regular and continuing contact with our humanitarian partners on the ground uh, in Afghanistan. As I mentioned, uh, a good chunk of money, some $5 million, has already been administered by the WHO. This is just one segment of uh, the 330 some odd million dollars that the United States has committed uh, in, this, in this fiscal year. Back in July, there were an estimated 50,000 Afghan interpreters looking for a way out of the country. There have been immense efforts to help some of them, but many are still waiting for the opportunity. One U.S. veteran made it his mission to rescue the interpreters left behind, but as he struggled with his own battles, he took his life. Now his fellow troop members are coming together to help finish the mission he started. Newsy Sasha Ingber brings us that story. We do want to warn you, this piece features sensitive content, including discussions of suicide. Here's that story. God, we are here today because of our loss. First, a suicide, then veterans carrying on his mission. We all know the horrors of war, you know, and a lot of the details Michael kept from us. I mean, he knew it would break our hearts and, and he kept it inside and he, he buried it there. Former Navy Corpsman Michael McCarthy took his own life in his L.A. apartment in August, just as Taliban troops were rolling toward Kabul. The collapse of the country, just a matter of time. And that's Michael and his um, troop. We're all still, I guess, in a little disbelief. I think he knew that they were going to take over Kabul well before we, they actually did, and I think that was kind of, that was too much for him. Corman McCarthy had spoken with Newsy just weeks before in the midst of a desperate and personal mission to rescue two interpreters he had worked with in Afghanistan. Michael, I just started the recording. My name is Michael Shane McCarthy. I was a Navy U.S. hospital corpsman in Afghanistan in 2008. Back in July, he was frustrated by the bureaucracy and confusion of how to get visas for the Afghans he was trying to help. I personally put my hopes in the hands of God at this point. Before he died at age 39, McCarthy got to see one former interpreter escape. Wolf, as the Marines called him, is now living illegally in Turkey and he fears he could be deported by a government that doesn't want Afghan refugees. The, the Turkish people called us the pious Americans. 
I don't know why. He says, you guys working with Americans, and now Americans leave Afghanistan. Why you guys can't be here? The other interpreter McCarthy was trying to evacuate told me he couldn't get out. We hope, we wish one day we can fly and escape from this hellish country. We're using his military nickname for security. Danny and his family face Taliban beatings and chaotic crowds as they try to enter the airport in Kabul, with the militants now controlling the city. He hadn't heard from McCarthy in days, so he opened his phone, turned to Facebook, and saw a rest in peace message on his wall. I asked from my, my friend, excuse me, what does it mean? What does it mean, rape? He said, rip mean, it is mean rest in peace. It is mean that person you say in here, he has died. Oh my God, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. It was the bad and worst news in my life. Suicide is all too familiar to the 2nd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment where McCarthy served. My youngest brother, Elias Reyes Jr., uh, served in 2-7. He did three deployments, two to Iraq, one to Afghanistan, the last one being with Michael McCarthy. My brother, uh, in 2014, took his life after having so many suicides from 2-7. It doesn't get easier. I think it's getting harder and harder. Veterans of the 2-7 tell Newsy they had six-hour firefights in Afghanistan and often ran out of ammunition, with no air support or medevac. They didn't even have enough water. Calling themselves the Forgotten Battalion, they'd watch their comrades die there and then at home. At least 37 have ended their own lives according to a database kept by a veteran of the unit. Some, like McCarthy, also struggled with addiction and homelessness. We asked the Department of Veterans Affairs whether they track veteran suicide by military unit. They told us they don't request that information from the Defense Department. We would have to have assurance that it was validly representative and reliably representative. A 2015 New York Times report found the 2-7 had a suicide rate 14 times the average for Americans. Surviving veterans have made a practice of coming to each other's aid when yet another suicide occurs. But McCarthy's death is different. A group of veterans are coming together to finish what he nobly started. I felt I owed it to him to see through to the end his final mission. Former squad leader Dustin Batson had been working with McCarthy to try to get the interpreter Danny out of Afghanistan. Batson says he formed a bond with Danny on the day of a suicide bombing in 2008. A suicide bomber had jumped on the hood of the Humvee and blew himself up uh, in the middle of a bazaar. So all the Marines were fine, but it killed and maimed a whole bunch of civilians. And so Mike, being our corpsman, uh, treated all the wounded. A lot of them were small kids, and it really affected them. And just, he was never quite the same after that day. Danny was by Michael McCarthy's side, not interpreting, but helping him treat the wounded. Danny later became a doctor because of that experience, and McCarthy paid for his medical schooling in India. Danny and his family only returned to Afghanistan so that his ailing mother could die in their homeland. How are you from the United States here in Texas able to work on getting him out of Afghanistan? And I don't know how much I want to say because it's like a security thing, um, but we have secured safe houses that are protected, and I say protected, disgustingly enough, we have to pay off the Taliban um, to just basically not mess with them. So what needs to happen now for Danny to leave Afghanistan? Permission from the State Department. That's it. 
He's waiting for approval to put Danny and his family on a plane, with Doha agreeing to take them. But priority has been given to Americans and green card holders. What if you don't get Danny out? There is no contingency where we don't get him out. I'll go over there and get him out myself. Batson says he owes it to Danny and to McCarthy's memory. I'm going to end this now. I've got some of Michael's ashes. I'm not going to just sprinkle it on the beach here, but maybe later take a little walk down by the water. Anyone who wants to go with me at that time is more than welcome to, you know. Thank you again. Thank you so much. That report was brought to us by Sasha Ingber, Newsy's national security correspondent, who's been heading up our coverage of what's going on in Afghanistan and working closely with sources on the ground. Sasha joins us now. Um, Sasha, first question, what's the latest on Danny? Christian, the State Department ended up giving landing rights to Danny, and as of this morning, around 7.30 Eastern time, Danny was sitting on a plane... Uh, I was watching closely on a flight tracking app and he did take off and just hours ago landed in Abu Dhabi. So it's a happy ending for him and his family in one sense and also a new beginning because now a journey begins to try to bring him to the United States. And Wolf, the Afghan interpreter who is now in Turkey, he had initially had his special immigrant visa application denied. And he's told me that some hope for him too, it is now being reviewed again. Sasha, what prompted you to follow this story? Well, I found out about Mike killing himself in the midst of covering Afghanistan in those last weeks of US troops in the country. It was an incredibly chaotic time and hearing that someone that I had spoken to just weeks before was incredibly hard to hear because there was so much strife just inside the country. A lot of veterans were reflecting and thinking about whether or not the work they had done, the service in Afghanistan and their sacrifices were worth it. And here was a person who had taken his own life. And it almost made me feel a little guilty that I had only spent maybe 30 minutes initially interviewing him, not learning his full story. And I think it's natural when there's a person who kills him or herself to wonder if there's anything more that you could have done, if there were signs that you didn't see. And this was a chance for me to tell more of Michael's story. And we're grateful for you know, the work that you've been able to do here in telling this story. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, is there uh, any concern for the safety of other veterans who uh, fought in Afghanistan? Well, the head of the suicide prevention program at the VA, he told me that he's concerned that the U.S. exit is going to impact all uh, veterans. And he also said that during that two or three week period, the Veterans Crisis Line saw um, about 6% more calls than they had in the previous year. So clearly there was a point in time where veterans were responding to the situation. Uh, and uh, there's also kind of a question that came to me in doing this story. The VA tells me that they track veteran suicide by age, by gender, race, ethnicity, but they don't track by military unit. And it made me wonder whether or not there should be a more nuanced understanding. Are all veterans the same? Are their experiences uniform? Absolutely not. So when we talk about veteran suicide, should, be, should we be taking more of that into account as well? Sasha Ingber, thank you so much for your contribution. We appreciate you.
We really appreciate Sasha for bringing us that reporting. We'll be sure to follow up on developments related to Afghanistan. Up next, we're hitting on a few things that have been at the top of your social media feeds, from the WNBA championship to the life and complicated legacy of Colin Powell. What if the news was different and covered more than one side of the story? Justice wasn't served. So you can make up your own mind. I love her so much. Introducing the new point of view, yours. Newsy, watch free 24 hour news. Welcome back, folks. You know, some days figuring out what's trending online and why is like reading that digital code from the Matrix. Do you always look at it and code it? Well, you have to. That unintelligible mess of zeros and ones and special characters. Lucky for you, that's our second language. Here's what people are talking about on social media. Search interest in secondhand shopping is at an all time high in the US, giving you procrastinating shoppers a leg up just in time for the holiday season. Even Amazon is doing it, although on a much larger scale. That search trend is taking off as supply chain issues really threaten to mess up holiday shopping this year. And according to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, it ain't letting up anytime soon. Well, certainly a lot of the challenges that we've ex been experiencing this year will continue into next year. The Biden administration has tried to relieve some of the supply chain issues by announcing that the Port of LA would now operate 24 seven, which plays a big role in the global supply chain. In the meantime, it's probably not a bad idea to start shopping secondhand instead of waiting until you have a bolt of anxiety shooting through you because you waited too long. That goes for me too. The Chicago Sky beat the Phoenix Mercury to win their first WNBA championship in the franchise's 16 year history. The big talker after the win was the performance of Illinois native Candace Parker. She joined the Sky just eight months ago and helped lift the team from a 500 regular season record to a title in her first season. It took LeBron way longer than that to get a ring for the Cavs. But maybe the bigger note here is how the league has grown. Game two of the series between the Sky and the Mercury saw 789,000 average viewers, which was the most viewed finals game since 2017. The teams played to a sold out crowd inside Chicago's Wintrust Arena, and the first two WNBA finals games were shown on ABC and ESPN. This year, the league's 25th, saw the most watched regular season since 2008, which was also a 51% increase over last season. While there are only 12 teams to cheer for right now, that might not always be the case. WNBA commissioner Kathy Engelbert says expansion is on the horizon and the league is currently vetting new cities. Former Secretary of State Colin Powell passed away this morning at 84. The retired four-star general died from COVID complications and had underlying medical conditions. The son of two Jamaican immigrants, Secretary of Powell was the first African-American Secretary of State and had a reputation as a dedicated military advisor to leading politicians across the aisle. But his legacy is much more complicated thanks to his decisive role in the 2003 invasion of Iraq. While trying to make the invasion an international effort, Powell gave a now infamous speech at the United Nations asserting Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and posed an imminent threat. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Two years later, Secretary Powell would later tell ABC News the speech was a blot on his career, saying, quote, I'm the one who presented it on behalf of the United States to the world, and it will always be a part of my record. It was painful. It's painful now. We're gonna stay on Colin Powell here for just a moment. The 84 year old former general had a breakthrough case of COVID-19, which got some people talking about the efficacy of available COVID vaccines. But Powell was also battling cancer, a disease which as we know, can affect a person's immune system. Newsy's health and science reporter, Lindsay Thies has been covering the intricacies of this pandemic since the beginning. She gives us a little more information to chew on regarding breakthrough cases and how a person's health can play into fending off COVID-19. 
Colin Powell has died from COVID-19 related complications. Medically, that means damage to the organs other than the lungs. COVID can cause clots that uh, can then go and cause problems throughout the rest of the body. When we talk about complications of COVID, really what we're talking about is kind of these downstream effects that come along with the critical illness that's caused by the virus. Powell's underlying health conditions, Parkinson's and multiple myeloma, put him at higher risk for severe COVID even with vaccination. Myeloma, a blood cancer, makes it harder for the body to fight infection. Research shows those patients don't get as much protection from COVID vaccines. Both of those uh, can cause multi-systemic changes in the body. So that's, you know, changes in multiple organ systems. His age, 84, also a huge factor. Powell's COVID case is considered a breakthrough infection, getting sick with COVID after being fully vaccinated. A breakthrough infection, um, whether it's Moderna, Pfizer, or Johnson & Johnson, the data shows the further you're away from that initial vaccine, uh, full vaccination schedule, um, the more we've seen breakthrough infections. The latest CDC data on breakthroughs from October 12th cites about 31,000 breakthrough cases, roughly 7,000 of those deaths. That is out of 187 million fully vaccinated Americans. Meanwhile, people like Maricel St. Clair, who had a mild COVID case in August, aren't counted. I tested myself in the morning, not thinking for a second I would be positive, and it just lit up, and I was astonished. I could not believe that I was positive for COVID. I'm not trying to discourage the vaccinations, right? I'm trying to do just the opposite. I want to encourage the booster. For the average person, getting the vaccine, um, the chances of ending up in a situation like Colin Powell are very, very low. Now, if somebody um, has loved ones or themselves has one of the conditions or both of the conditions, more conditions like those that Colin Powell suffered from, um, they may have more reason to be worried. In those cases, experts say the best thing to do is the same thing we've heard through much of this pandemic. In addition to vaccination, social distance, and wear a mask. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, San Francisco. Much appreciated, Lindsay. Hopefully her work has helped y'all dodge the mis and disinformation and just all around bad takes when it comes to the pandemic, which we are moving on from. When you're back, we're talking climate change and how a new government policy change can affect people living in flood prone areas. We'll see you after the break. Sunday nights. Newsy takes you to the edge. Exploring untold stories. It's literally an existential threat. Going far beyond the headlines. Today, social media is the real world. Hey, grandkids. There needs to be a bridging of the gap. In real life, a next generation news magazine. New episodes, Sunday nights at 8.30, 7.30 Central, only on Newsy. Welcome back to In The Loop. Millions of Americans live in flood zones, but floods can happen pretty much anywhere. For those Americans in homes with flood insurance, a new FEMA policy change could affect how much those pay for each year. Some people may pay less, but some, especially in areas set to be hit hard by climate change, might have to pay more. National correspondent Chloe Nordquist has more on how these changes might affect you. Flooding can happen to anyone. In all 50 states have experienced some significant flooding. Recently, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, changed flood insurance premiums for the first time in quite a while. The old model was kind of a 1986 Pontiac. Uh, it wasn't wrong. It could get you from point A to point B, um, but it was a pretty blunt instrument. The new program is called Risk Rating 2.0. Roy Wright, the former chief executive of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program and current CEO of the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, says the agency is using more science and better technology to recalculate everyone's flood risk. And you need to pay a rate that is fair and um, specific to uh, the community and the house where you live. Beginning in October of 2021, all of these changes affect new customers. Beginning in April of 2022, and on a rolling basis for 12 months, as existing customers renew, they will then experience these changes that are brought about by Risk Rating 2.0. 
So this is actually a very long time coming, and it's certainly not without controversy. Jeff Slegamelch is the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. That this is, you know, sort of a first step towards making the uh, national flood insurance program more solvent, but it's only one small piece of a much larger consideration of where we build, how we build, and what is the true cost uh, of building in vulnerable areas. You know, uh, these disasters are, are happening with increasing frequency and intensity. Uh, the cost of these disasters continues to go up. The true impact of these rate changes will depend on where you live. Roy says one in four families will see a price cut, and most will see their rates stay the same, but others will pay more. There's a group of 10 to 12 percent, at least at a national level, uh, of folks for whom they're presently paying less than they should. Uh, and they will see their rates uh, take a series of steps forward in the coming years. Those new rates won't happen all at once. They will not see an increase of more than 18% per year. But for some, this new rating system is causing a lot of confusion. A uh, risk rating 2.0 kind of snuck up on us. Bill Bubrig is an insurance professional in Louisiana. People with the existing flood policies at least have time to catch their breath and they're on this glide path at an 18% clip a year. But it's the people who don't have existing flood policies that are now going from 600, less than $600 a year to over 3,000 bucks immediately. Bill says over time, it could impact where we see people build and move in the future. It's going to kill the um, real estate world. We've continued to build and sell homes in flood prone areas at insurance prices that don't reflect the actual risk. Keeping pace with climate change is clearly part of the new risk rating approach. I'm Chloe Nordquist reporting. Many thanks to Chloe for that story. It's really just another reminder of how climate change hits so many parts of our lives. We're heading into another break, so you can stop dividing your attention between me and whatever's on your phone. We'll let it have you for a moment. When you're back, we'll have more on how breast cancer can affect your mental health. During the month of October, you're gonna see a lot of pink ribbons, from pens on clothing to football players' shoes. The month has become synonymous with breast cancer awareness. Roughly one in eight women will develop invasive breast cancer over the course of their life. The diagnosis can be life-altering, especially when fighting cancer is only one of the battles. Oftentimes, there's also an extreme mental toll. Newsy's national correspondent, Amber Strong, has covered a range of stories related to women's health. She sat down with one woman who found a unique way to cope in the face of devastating obstacles. So can you imagine this little girl from an impoverished neighborhood made this? This is lotion. Showing off her scratch-made oils, lotions, and soaps, Victoria Thomas Bodie is in her element. This is calendula petals in here. This is hibiscus in here. Her Indianapolis-based bath and body shop, The Pink Tub, has been successful, to say the least. We normally do between 20, sometimes we could do 30 in a week, but look at this. This is gone. But getting to this point has been a journey. She conceptualized the idea two years before a triple negative breast cancer diagnosis but she really started playing around with various lotions and oils during radiation treatment. So I started to see the color come back. The scaliness disappeared. My uh, radiologist at that time, Dr. Ng, he was like, what, what are you doing? And I was like, I'll make my products. I told you that, I thought I told you that. And he was like, no. And so he was like, uh, could you tell me a secret? I was like, no, if I do, I have to kill you. This now thriving business would become the catalyst that pulled her through what was ahead. In 2017, after chemo, radiation, and surgery, she was cancer-free and ready to get back to business. Then, more heartbreak. Her husband and biggest cheerleader, Kevin, was diagnosed with cerebral brain aneurysms. He passed away into, in our apartment in the Bronx, and I witnessed it all. And to witness death, it sent me from being, um, manic depression from the cancer to PTSD. And I struggled with that. 
and I still struggle with that. Mental health experts say women facing a breast cancer diagnosis experience a wide range of emotions from anxiety over their appearance in the aftermath to fears over finances and childcare. When you couple that with the hardships of everyday life, it leaves many of those same women seeking answers. How am I going to do my job? How am I going to take care of my kids and manage things at home? And just what is my life going to look like? Former Association of Oncology Social Work President Hester Hill Schnipper says there are various ways patients can begin to cope. Social supports, family, friends, that helps the most. I think distractions often help. A little bit of denial goes a long way. I mean, as long as you show up for whatever the medical things are you need to show up for, I think whatever else you need to not think about while you're going through you know, is just fine. Having faced two breast cancer diagnoses, she says she would never say having cancer was a good thing but the aftermath can sometimes lead to reflection. The fact is most of us don't end up making big changes, but most of us do end up fiddling with the edges of our lives and hopefully ending up in a place in which we are happier than we might have been without cancer. Thomas Bodie says in between the despair and loss, there were tiny seeds of inspiration. We use 80% goat milk which is a great emollient for your body. Like all of this, I was learning uh, going through radiation, just learning what's good for your skin. She calls her lotions and soaps, along with her faith, therapeutic, giving her renewed purpose and drive every day. I'll tell anyone, let go and allow God to manifest. He might not give you what you want, but he'll give you what you deserve and you need. I'm a visionary. He gave me that vision. Amber Strong, Newsy. Much appreciated, Amber. This month, the spotlight is on breast cancer, but finding out you have the so-called big C, no matter the type, can be a scary and isolating experience. Tack on a deadly pandemic where we are encouraged to keep our distance, and that can add an extra layer of loneliness. Support groups have had to adapt, and at times, limiting the way they can help patients. Newsy's Chris Conti shows us the challenges they've had to overcome to connect with those looking for help. Breathing the fresh air and if you see something, it's a real bonus. The journey for Kathy Shea often follows a path of uncertainty. Go down to about one I to see two o'clock yep. and you can see it with I your naked eye. I absolutely do. This lifelong bird watcher who gets up with the sun never knew how much she appreciated nature until recently. On March 19th of 2020, I was diagnosed with um, thyroid cancer. Right as the pandemic began, Kathy's world was shaken. Like so many Americans diagnosed with cancer during COVID, Kathy's news came over the phone. Cancer in general is, is very, it's, it's lonely, but at that point in time, it was even more lonely. I would drive myself into the hospital. For the 1.8 million Americans like Kathy diagnosed with cancer in 2020, it's been particularly difficult managing treatments while also trying to avoid COVID. I wouldn't go to a big football game. That's just too scary for me. You don't even try to hope anymore. You try to just keep your blinders on and just stay where we are and not think about it. And, and it's exhausting. There's something calming about being in nature. We first met Meg Koch in February and wanted to check back in with her. Meg oversees the Virginia Thurston Healing Garden, a cancer support center. The seasons have changed here, but not much else. It's all new how team meetings are still done virtually. And because of the Delta variant, group therapy sessions, yoga, every service offered here still has to be done online. It's just not safe for people with compromised immune systems to gather. I walk through here and it's like nobody's getting the advantage of this beautiful space. That's sad. For Americans living with cancer, it's been a long two years. And the need for places like this only seems to be growing. People's needs are not being met in the way that they used to. It's not all bad news, though. Brianne Carter runs the metastatic support group here. Because of Zoom, people are still able to be together, even at the very final stages of life, something that wasn't possible before. The pandemic has provided a lot of barriers, but it also created an avenue for this particular group of people that wasn't there before. Oh, beautiful. As for Kathy Shea, the last two years have brought her a new appreciation of life. If not now, when? 
You know, do it now. Don't put it off. A second chance to truly enjoy and savor the world around her. I'm Chris Conti. Much appreciated, Chris. There's been a lot of talk of vaccine hesitancy, but what does that really mean? Can it be used to describe all of the people who are unvaccinated or is that a bit reductive? After the break, we're looking at the multiple factors at play when it comes to getting a COVID-19 shot. COVID is the top health issue right now, but vaccines help. But there's still gaps in vaccination rates. They're often lower in communities of color due to accessibility issues and misinformation. Newsy is partnering with the Washington Post's video team to bring you more in-depth reporting and analysis, including this breakdown of what those vaccination gaps look like. This is the official definition of vaccine hesitancy, according to the World Health Organization but it's become a catch-all to broadly describe the unvaccinated. Vaccine hesitancy can mean 10 different things to 10 different people. This is Monica Shoxbana. She's a senior scientist at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the co-principal investigator of Communivax, a national coalition focused on vaccine equity. She says naming vaccine hesitancy as the problem or blaming minority groups Many people in uh, black and brown communities are refusing to take the vaccine can conceal issues of access, especially in low-income communities of color. Shaksvana and a group of researchers studied why members of black and Hispanic communities weren't getting vaccinated. If we don't diagnose the problem correctly, we're not going to be able to implement the right treatment. So let's diagnose the problem. The research team found that hesitancy isn't the only reason people are not getting vaccinated. In the Hispanic community alone, there are dozens of reasons why a person has delayed getting the vaccine. Misinformation was one. My granddaughter, she said, I'm planning to have a baby in one, two years. I don't know what's going to happen with my baby. We also hear in terms of, you know, the chip, the microchip, and we work hard to inform them. We have had this vaccine long enough to get good research data, showing proof that that is inaccurate. Access was also a problem. Many Hispanic adults said there were technology, transportation, or language barriers. Is the problem the fact that a monolingual Spanish speaker who doesn't have a digital device cannot get an appointment to get vaccinated? Communities of color are not homogenous, and infrastructure issues in the public health care system can exist in some places and not in others. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the health department in Baltimore City, which deals with a Black majority population, was not well equipped to meet the emergency needs of a new and growing segment of the population, many of whom are uh, monolingual Spanish speakers. Some immigrants and their family members said they feared accessing the vaccine due to their status and being asked for an official government ID or social security number. They don't want to draw attention to themselves or to their larger network. Vaccines are free for all U.S. residents and adults, regardless of immigration status or access to insurance. But some have still been turned away. While many states allow vaccinations with a utility bill or work ID, that information is not readily available. In rural Idaho, the local research team worked with the health department to change their ID practices. It's changes like that, changes in how public health invites people in to take advantage of a service and good like vaccination that make a difference. So what now? As the pandemic continues, Shaksbana believes overcoming these barriers will require a hyper-local strategy. We have to bring vaccination information and the vaccination experience to places that are considered familiar, safe, and convenient for people. Nearly half of unvaccinated Hispanic adults say they are more likely to get vaccinated if it was offered at a place they normally go to for care. Four in 10 said they would get vaccinated if their employer arranged it at their workplace. Researchers and advocates say it's important to support trusted community-based organizations and healthcare workers who are already doing the work on the ground. They trust us. 
they know our organization, they know me. That portion of our health system is ad hoc and fragmented. Our community health system needs to be more socially valued, more operationally functional, and also sustainably financed. A big thanks to our friends at the Washington Post for that piece. We hope you like what we're doing here on ITL. Let your friends know you're watching by posting about it using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. As long as it's honest feedback, we'll take it, even if it hurts my feelings. We have one more break, but you've been in the loop with us long enough that we hope you'll want to see it through to the end. So stay with us. We're closing the loop when you're back. What do you think the future looks like? From Newsy, renowned journalists and filmmakers, comes a celebration of storytelling. Are we in a killer robots arms race right now? When the suspect admits to it, I'm not going to argue the, the law with you. <sighs> New features every week. Newsy Docs presents Sunday nights at 9, 8 central, only on Newsy. We can't finish off the show without closing the loop and putting today's top stories back in front of you. So let's take a moment and jump back into those. When US troops first withdrew from Afghanistan, it made headlines everywhere. You couldn't open up a news site or listen to a news podcast without getting stories about the withdrawal and the seemingly messy conclusion of America's longest war. It's been more than a month since the last of the US troops left, and while the news cycle has shifted toward other topics, the problems have only been ramping up for people still living in Afghanistan. The country has seen a string of violent attacks with recent bombings of mosques, killing dozens of people each time. ISIS-K, or the Islamic State, who are enemies of the Taliban, have claimed responsibility for some of those attacks. The Taliban has also returned to brutal punishments like public hangings, and they haven't stuck to their promises of giving women fair treatment. There's also an economic and humanitarian crisis on the rise. The central bank is frozen, there has been a huge rise in the price of goods, and many people aren't getting paid. We have been in regular and continuing contact with our humanitarian partners on the ground uh, in Afghanistan. As I mentioned, uh, a good chunk of money, some $5 million, has already been administered by the WHO. This is just one segment of uh, the 330 some odd million dollars that the United States has committed uh, in, this, in this fiscal year. Then, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Newsy's Amber Strong gave us a look inside at the challenges that come with fighting what can be a scary diagnosis. Mental health experts say women facing a breast cancer diagnosis experience a wide range of emotions from anxiety over their appearance in the aftermath to fears over finances and childcare. When you couple that with the hardships of everyday life, it leaves many of those same women seeking answers. How am I going to do my job? How am I going to take care of my kids and manage things at home? And just what is my life going to look like? Former Association of Oncology Social Work President Hester Hill Schnipper says there are various ways patients can begin to cope. Social supports, family, friends, that helps the most. I think distractions often help. A little bit of denial goes a long way. I mean, as long as you show up for whatever the medical things are you need to show up for, I think whatever else you need to not think about while you're going through you know, is just fine. That's it for In The Loop tonight, but don't worry, we don't really give you much of an opportunity to miss me. I'll be back soon enough with a whole new episode. In the meantime, just keep it here on Newsy. We've got plenty of other shows coming your way.